In Britain's countryside, a revolution is underway. A whole new generation of trailblazers are making their mark. People with energy, innovation and passion who are reinventing old trades and setting up modern rural businesses. Wow, look at that! Oh, my God! <laughs> I'm travelling all the way from the stunning coastal county of Cornwall to the rolling dales of Yorkshire to spend time with some of the most passionate and often headstrong rural pioneers. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Anyone else need a bucket? Going to tip it in the tractor? Yeah. Following them through the highs I've got some. <laughs> and the hard times. Do you know it's definitely going to fit? £200,000. That's terrifying. Yeah, it is. As they strive to turn dreams... Oh, my goodness! Extraordinary. ...into thriving enterprises. She's pregnant! <laughs> Whee! I'll be joining them at the most crucial time in their business year to find out what it really takes to make a living going back to the land. Every season and every region present new challenges. I'm heading to the southern coast of England. Richard. Hello, I'm Kate. Hello. Hi. Lovely, Lovely to, meet to meet you. Meeting four rural entrepreneurs. We really believe in British farming. Who've turned their passion. We always ate what we caught. So I guess trout's in my DNA, really. Into innovative businesses. <gasps> That's astonishing. Striving to turn tradition on its head. I'm having awful <laughs> memories of trying to thread a sewing machine. Yeah. And making a living off the land. Hampshire and Wiltshire are home to many areas of outstanding natural beauty, including Salisbury Plain, the South Downs and the New Forest. And they rate amongst the top areas to live in the UK for quality of life. Today, 90% of the county's wide variety of enterprises are micro-businesses. Historically, many would have been farmers producing wool. Sheep have been part of Britain's landscape since the Roman times. Their meat, wool, skins and milk were the basis of medieval trade. But in the 1960s, wool production fell dramatically, losing out to the synthetic imports. This once striving industry now makes up just 4% of all fibres used in the UK. I'm outside the village of Well to meet Emma, whose innovative approach to producing wool is now at a crucial stage as she does her bit to try and put the British woolen industry back on the world map. It's November. With absolutely no farming experience, Emma and her husband Neil bought a dilapidated farm 13 years ago as a renovation project. Emma set out to give purpose back to the former dairy farm and invested in Gotland sheep, working with local shepherdess Susie. The more people said you can't make a business out of wool, the more I felt that I needed to prove that wrong. Nine years on, this artisan business is now producing 500 kilos of unique British yarn every year. I'll be following the fortunes of Emma and Susie as they approach their busiest time to date. So far, they've reinvested every penny back into the business, but this year they've set their sights on turning that around. Over the next few crucial months, they will discover if they can finally draw a salary. Oh, I love this site. 
Emma, hello. Hi. I'm Kate. <laughs> Lovely, Lovely to, meet to meet you. There's nothing more wonderful than watching a sheepdog work, is there? It's just amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Especially when they're working so well with a handler. Yeah. And yeah. you can see the real partnership. I should have brought my dog, although I'm not, <laughs> not quite sure it would have been as beautifully controlled as this. <laughs> so we've been keeping sheep now for about 13, 14 years. Yeah. Which is where I met Susie, because Susie came to help me when I had my foundling flock of 10. Right. She's had her own flock since she was about 12. Right. And been shearing since then. She's very tolerant of um, me being quite a beginner with the sheep. <laughs> Emma invested in her first Gotland sheep 13 years ago. This breed was first established on the Swedish island of Gotland by the Vikings. And we bought our first seven, yeah. and we now have the largest flock in the UK. Which is? Um, about 450. <laughs> <laughs> Should we let them, yes, let them that through? Would be good. They are lovely, aren't they? Beautiful coloured fleeces. They go from a silvery grey right through to a sort of pewter. Gorgeous. A Absolutely very, gorgeous. Very attractive. Sorry, Susie, we're just completely in your way. Your dog's doing a marvellous job. <laughs> They're very small, aren't they? Can we come and say hello? So this is this year's lamb. This is its first fleece. So you can see the length. It is amazing, isn't it? And it is beautifully soft. I'm sorry. I'm admiring you, though. And so, for you, Susie, what are you looking at? So, I'm looking at the length, the colour as well, because that's quite important to us. And it's just got a nice crimp to it. And the luster as well, the shine. It is. It's absolutely beautiful. How are they to shear? They are quite tricky. <laughs> <because> <laughs> I was going to say, they um, look tricky. They do not like sitting on their bottoms. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the 450-strong flock is maintained by Susie. She's developing a breeding programme to create a unique British fleece of the same high quality as the famous Merino breed. Now, I thought, you know, the kind of classic wool sheep was the Merino. Merino's quite a matte... Right. Fibre. Yeah. Um, but with the Gotland, you have this lovely luster, which actually makes it feel softer. I'm guessing your scarf is made of it, is it? This is actually Stein, which is our own breed from the farm. OK, hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Emma and Susie decided to crossbreed their Gotland sheep to produce a superior fleece, which allows them to create their very own artisan wool. This isn't just any wool, it's Stein fine yarn. And we actually, a couple of years ago, imported our own superfine merino rams to further improve the genetics. Can I have a little fumble? Yes, of course you can. Oh, my goodness. So it's incredibly soft. It's incredibly soft, but it's got a lovely texture to it as yes. well. That's the most extraordinary journey. We've now lost your sheep. Should yes. we go and find them? <laughs> <laughs> Their drive to produce the ultimate luxury wool means that their entire management system is geared towards wool production. The sheep are moved regularly around the 310-acre farm to protect their fleece from a build-up of mud. Do you think this kind of collaboration between business brain and expertise in animal management is a potential future model? Meaning that farms like this have a really sustainable future. No matter how hard I worked within this industry, I wouldn't be able to afford a farm myself. But this gives me the, the freedom to work a flock as if it is my own. And it's just so refreshing to have somebody who's coming into it with a completely different outlook and is open to trying different things. It's worked because we're both passionate about doing something with the wool and with the fleece but also this common desire we have to always be better. You've talked a lot about this wool. I've fondled your scarf, but I would actually like to see the product itself. Is that possible? Yes, of course. Let's go back to the barn. Yeah. Might there be a kettle? Oh, there well. will be a kettle. <laughs> Rearing and breeding the sheep is only the start of the process.
turning the fleece into wool, dyeing and marketing it as a viable product is Emma's side of the business. Oh my goodness, what, oh! Look at all these beautiful colours. It's really odd, isn't it? You don't connect beautiful wool like this with the animals that we've just been with in the field. Well, especially not when you're slipping around in no. the muck. <laughs> <laughs> the muck and bullets that we've just come in from. So this is the Gotland yarn. Right, so these are the sheep that... You we... had a cuddle with. I had a cuddle with. And this is the natural colour that we get once it comes back from the spinners. OK. So this is my natural base. To Gosh, die on. I mean, that's a beautiful colour in itself. It is isn't lovely, it? isn't it? Emma's one of the only wool producers in the UK to self dye her own products. From sheep to wool, it's a very long, risky process. So we've waited five months to have our lambs, we've waited a year to shear those lambs, we've then sent it away. So it's washed in Yorkshire, it goes down to the spinners down in Devon. Yeah. And it takes about a year from the time I send it off to coming a back. A year? And really it's only then when we get that fibre back spun that you can really look at it and go, oh, actually we did a really good job and now I can dye it. So you haven't even dyed it? Of course no, I haven't even dyed, dyed it yet. at that point. It must be terrifying, isn't it's it? It's been really difficult. And to add to the pressure, Emma recently invested £15,000 on machinery to help speed up the next stage of production and increase the quantity of yarn they can process. So we're going to pull this forward and... It looks I... like an instrument of torch. <laughs> <laughs> it can be if it gets knotted. So if you... Um... Do I drape it over there? Yes, and just try and get it round. And push it. Back so it clicks. OK. Now, we're going to come up over here. Under, That's it. Like that, yeah. yeah. And down. And then we're going round. Yeah. And this is sort of a tensioner. I'm having awful <laughs> memories of <laughs> sewing lessons at school and being try and trying to thread a sewing machine, yeah. and I could never, And actually ever getting do it, it right. Yeah. right. OK. Yeah. So then we're just going to drop the end in here, pop it on there, and we're going to push that round. OK? Simple. Simple. Right. Are you doing this? basically every day. I'm doing all the different bits all the, all the time. This is the epitome of an artisan product. Yeah. Everything from the lamb yes. right the way through to the finished beautiful wool. And it's being done on this very small scale. Yes. Presumably all wool isn't cheap. I don't think it's expensive when I consider I've been up at 3 o'clock in the morning or Susie's out there yeah. um, sort of 12 hours a day. Normally we sell in a 100 gram skein for the Gotland would yeah. be something like £22.50. Right. But one of the things that we were quite innovative about is doing mini skeins of only 20 grams. Right. It allows people to make a very small investment in our yarn and see if they actually like it. So the money that you've made from selling the wool, have you invested that back into the business pretty house. much every penny that we've made has been invested back in right where we've got to now is that we need to be able to pay proper a proper salary yeah it's not a hobby no. it is a, a full-on business and, and a lot of work a huge amount of work and it has to stand on its own two feet and if they are to do that the coming month will be the ultimate test for this business what an absolutely fascinating business and what I love about it is that it shows how productive a partnership can be between somebody who really knows farming and somebody who's come in with no preconceptions, not constrained by the way things are done and together they have created something completely unique and totally British. But what I'm really looking forward to is actually seeing the kind of next stage of production, the crucial stage. The shearing, how do you know whether this year's fleeces are going to mean that they have a successful year a year hence from now, because that's how long they have to wait to know whether the wool's good enough to sell. It's incredibly nerve-wracking, but it's incredibly exciting too. I'll be back in a few weeks' time as the workload increases. Susie sets about shearing 450 sheep and Emma starts the process of sorting through one and a half tonnes of fleece.
the 220 square miles of the new forest is a stronghold for around 2,700 species of fungi essential to its ecosystem. We Brits love our mushrooms, from the wild ones that grow in profusion in places like Hampshire's new forest to the ones that we spend literally hundreds of millions of pounds on a year buying them in our supermarkets. As a nation, we spent over £365 million on mushrooms last year, making them Britain's third most popular veg item in our shopping basket. I'm in Holmesley, Hampshire. I'm here to meet ex-chef Richard, whose fascination for fungi has led him to bring a taste of the exotic to Hampshire. Eleven years ago, Richard and his wife returned to the new forest from the far east, where he'd been working in a top restaurant. Inspired by his experience in Asia and cooking for the fungi-mad diners, on his return to the UK, when recreating some of his beloved dishes, he was unable to source the exotic mushrooms he required. So he decided to start a business growing them. <laughs> Richard. Hello, I'm Kate. Hello there, Lovely I'm Richard. Lovely to meet you. Hello, who are you? Yeah. This is Kira. That, that's Kira, is it? And who are you? Mia. Hello, Mia. Whose hand are you holding? Mummy. Mummy. Hello, Mummy. This is Helen. <laughs> <laughs> lovely to meet you all. Are you having a lovely morning? Yeah. Are you? What a fantastic place to have on your doorstep. Wonderful. Isn't it? Are you a Hampshire boy born and bred? Yes, I am. Right. Yes. I had my own restaurant for nine years. Right. And then I moved to the Far East. Wow. And spent seven years in the Shangri-La in Kuala Lumpur. So right at the top of your game then, actually. Uh, yes. But my uh, children were born and it was time to uh, put it on the back burner and start something else. Did you at that stage have any sense of what you might do to support your family? Not when I originally came back, no. Richard, that's quite uh, scary. Yes. <laughs> Richard now grows 12 different varieties of exotic mushrooms, producing up to 1,000 kilos a month. and selling them locally to restaurants, hotels, and to a big wholesaler in London. You know, you can go into any supermarket and buy mushrooms. So what made you think there could be an opening in the market that hadn't been filled? Just wanted to do something different. Yeah. We use mushrooms in many, many dishes in Asia. Right. And uh, it was an opportunity to do more varieties, something a little bit more exotic. Presumably, you had to learn how to do this. Had you ever grown mushrooms before? No, I did a lot of research. <laughs> um, I spent many hours researching information right. online about mushroom growing. Yeah. We seem to have lost your children. Should we go and find them? Are they <laughs> By chance, a local farmer had space lying dormant, so Richard seized the opportunity and began the scientific process of growing standard mushrooms. Thank you very much for letting me come and play with you in the woods this morning. It was very good fun. Thanks, Richard, very much. <laughs> You're so are you going to drop these guys off? Yes, we'll drop the kids off and I'll meet you at the barn. Lovely. All right, then. You're going to splash in that puddle before we go. <laughs> He struggled to make a living from standard mushrooms, so two years ago, he moved to a new premises and started growing more exotic varieties of fungi in containers. Now, you see, this is not what you expect <laughs> for a mushroom farm. No. <laughs> it's in here, is it? In here, yes. Ah, now, shipping containers. Go on, then. I love this. <laughs> oh, my goodness! <laughs> Look at this. Oh, gosh, there's something almost futuristic about it, isn't there? In this one container, what would your output be? This one container will produce half a tonne of mushrooms per month. That's astonishing. And aren't they beautiful? I don't think I've ever seen blue ones before. <laughs> they are classed as a blue oyster. 
Oh, they're stunning in these yellow ones. They're so delicate. So these, for example, this lovely little thing here, is that ready for harvesting? That's ready. OK. Do you want me to help? Because yes, I love we can a bit do of mushroom that. harvesting. Yes. These shipping containers are set up to mimic the seasons. Only by precisely controlling temperature, airflow and humidity levels will the mushrooms fruit. I mean, when you put one of these blocks in, when do they start sprouting? Within about seven to ten days. Right. Yeah. And then how long can you harvest from one block? Because we don't use any pesticides, we normally take three flushes from right. the bags and then they're disposed of. And you replace them? Yes. Okay. From this size yeah. to the larger one, that's about a day's growth. No way. Gosh, you must be able to almost yes. hear them grow. Yes. So how do I go about...? Take them at the base. Right. Literally just Perfect. pull? Perfect. And twist? Just pull and twist. Like that? And there we have oh, it. Look at that. The smell's wonderful, isn't it? Yes. It's a really, it's a lovely kind of delicate, earthy smell. I mean, is there a point where they get too big that they become kind of, I don't know, soggy or tough? Yes. This is pretty much the maximum. But the mushrooms have to be harvested every single day, including Christmas Day. Really? Yes. No days off? No days off. Any help? I do it all myself. Goodness. Thanks to celebrity chefs, exotic mushrooms have seen a rise in popularity over the last three years, and sales are growing faster than those of standard mushrooms. Oh, look this at that. One's... That's like a sort of bouquet, yes. almost. Almost like a cauliflower it or is, cabbage. It is, isn't it? It's beautiful. So these ones are too small? Too small, yes, but yeah. tomorrow they will be fine. OK, I'll stick those back up there. With your chef's hat on, what would you use these for? Something like a, a noodle soup, something with a little bit of spice. What sort of weight is that, do you think? This one's about 350 grams and in weight. how much would you be able to sell that for? Around about two pounds. Doesn't sound like enough, Richard. It's Not so really. beautiful. <laughs> this one here, is that big enough to go? That yellow oyster is ready to harvest, yes. OK, let me just... Have this that. one's perfect. Yeah. The other smaller ones are not quite ready. There's a slightly bigger one on the side. What do you think? Not quite. Not really. quite? No. OK. Is there anything else I can pick? In this controlled environment, Richard grows 12 different varieties of fungi. He's one of only a handful of exotic mushroom farmers in the UK. Oh, look in here. Another treasure trove. Wow. Richard also imports some different varieties of mushrooms each week. Look at that! But he's hoping to be able to grow them himself in the next few years. This one's the golden enoki. Yeah. The winter chanterelle. Yeah. They're wild at this time of the year. Right. Hen of the woods, very rich flavoured mushroom. Yeah. We have king oyster or eringi, good Amazing. meaty mushroom. <gasps> and then we have enoki. This one in particular is very difficult to grow. And with interest in his mushrooms continually growing, he plans to invest in a third container. Can I get you just to reignite your chef skills again? <laughs> yes. And could I have a little taste? We can certainly do that, but uh, the weather outside is not, not particularly good. No, so we can picnic on the floor of the barn. Fine. <laughs> Perfect. Absolutely. Right then, have you got a cooker? We do. The stove. Yep. Frying pan. Big slab of butter. That looks promising. Big, has to be butter. So no yes. healthy oils or anything. Unfortunately, not for this recipe. There's nothing unfortunate about it. <laughs> Most of the customers you've now built up, are they local or all London-based or a mixture around the country? I have one very good customer in London that will take any excess from me, but the wholesalers in this area are very good price-wise and they will pay a reasonable amount. And do they like the fact that it is a local or a locally produced product, even if it's a little bit exotic? It's certainly one of the biggest selling points that the customers want. Local produce that is sustainable and is of good quality. That smells... Wonderful. <laughs> I mean, you've cooked them for moments. Are they ready now? Yes. So all it's ready literally as quick as that. Yes. I know this is probably very badly behaved, but I don't care. Mmm. That's wonderful. 
So although you did take quite a big risk right at the beginning, any regrets? Not at this precise moment. No. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Richard. Are you quietly proud of what you've done? Yes, I am. Uh, we're one of the very few people in the UK that actually produce the amount of variety that we do. And beautifully. Yes. And they taste yeah. amazing. Yes. With half a pound of butter. <laughs> Richard, it's been a lovely day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You've got to admire Richard. You know, he gave up the security of employment so that he could spend more time with his family and set up on his own, doing a business about which he knew kind of nothing, through sheer graft and determination, has built up a really good, solid business. You know, it just goes to prove if you're determined enough and gutsy enough, you can make it work. The chalk streams of Hampshire and Wiltshire boast some of the finest trout fishing in the world. And one ex-city slicker has taken the plunge and started a business combining local skills and Hampshire's finest fishy resource to reel in customers. I started fishing at a very early age. We always ate what we caught, so I guess trout's in my DNA, really. In Salisbury, former equity broker Charlie turned his childhood passion for fishing into an innovative business. My name's Charlie, and I'm the founder of Charlie's Trout. We produce hot and cold smoked trout to order. Ethos Company is to produce the freshest, most delicious and most beautifully presented product that we can. Just two years on, he turns over almost £100,000 a year, selling his trout fillets and pâtés online and to local gastropubs and farm shops. The more people that taste the product, the more converts there are. And I think, you know, ultimately, the word is getting out there that, that, that salmon has, uh, has got, a, got a rival and a very serious rival. He's built his enterprising business by sourcing the finest fish farm and skilled smoker to help him craft his product, which, in turn, generates revenue for all of them. I'm very lucky to work with people that are passionate about the products that they produce. Charlie's fish are farmed on the gravel beds of the River Avon. There are 210 chalk streams in the world, 85% of them are in England. It's mineral rich, highly oxygenated chalk stream water, so it's a perfect environment for breeding fish. Morning, Jim, how are you? Morning, Charlie, how are you? Yeah, good, not bad. So these are the ones? Yeah, these have all been hand selected for you and put in this pond for harvest today. Charlie sources 150 kilos of fish a week from Trafalgar Fisheries. They've been farming these waters for 40 years and are the largest land fish farm in England. The daily catch is headed up by general manager Jim. Charlie came to me about 12 months ago and Charlie's passion towards what he's doing was something I really wanted to get involved with. What weight are these, Jim? These are 2 to 2.2 kilo fish. Yeah. So these will be harvesting very shortly. Unlike wild and sea caught fish, this whole operation is totally sustainable. And that is key in this day and age. Ah, cracking. They come on well, haven't they? They yeah, are. Really yeah. good. Brilliant. Yeah, very happy with those. Yeah. The real benefits of farming on the Hampshire Avon is the water quality is superior. The fish are almost fighting against the flow, which produces a fantastic flesh content. It takes 24 months to get those fish from egg to two and a half kilos. So I'm now talking to Jim about what I think I'm going to need Christmas 2020. Once harvested, 
Charlie takes his hand-picked stock for his weekly orders to a traditional smokehouse. He's teamed up with John, who is still using age-old methods to cure and smoke the fish. I work very closely with John for quite some time now. I love the fact that he oversees every step of the process, so I've never used anyone else or considered using anyone else. These fish will be salted for seven hours, and after the seven hours, they'll then be loaded into the smoker. The most important thing to Charlie is the quality of the product that we're producing for him. Everything's done by hand here. Fish are filleted by hand, they're boned by hand, they're sliced by hand. So it's really my years of experience that's adding to the quality of the product at the end. It's incredibly important that I surround myself with the best people. And you've got that continuity week in, week out. So we've got a product that is of the highest quality every week. When he started his business, he was processing approximately 80 kilos of fish a month. And this month, we're up to 800 kilos. So you can see how much the business has grown in two years. So far, Charlie's invested £40,000 on a website, packaging and marketing. After expenses and taxes, he's yet to turn a profit. But he's determined to stick to his ethos and deliver the freshest product. The way my week pans out, uh, on Monday, I collect all the orders. I ring the fish farm. They harvest the fish late Monday afternoon. They arrive at the smokery on Tuesday. They're prepped, they're smoked on Wednesday. On Thursday, they are pin-boned, they're sliced, they're packaged. For deliveries within 15, 20 miles, we take them ourselves. Those that are going further afield are packaged up, picked up by courier, and then delivered straight to the consumer, usually by about lunchtime on Friday. Turning his trout orders around in just a few days, Charlie's aim is to produce a fresh and truly local artisan product. Morning, Rob. Oh, hello, Charlie. How are you? Very well. Dozen of the finest. It's a new product. People aren't familiar with smoked trout, and, and, and that's been my biggest barrier. Spot on as always, Charlie. Thank you very much. Perfect. I think it is one of those products when people try it, they like it, they buy it. So the more people I can get to try the product, then the more successful we're going to be. I think the future's very bright. Smoked salmon is a massive, massive industry. There's absolutely no reason why smoked trout can't start eating into that market. Yeah, I love what I do. I love what I do. It's stressful at times, it's hard work, but would I want to put a suit on again, get back on a train? No, I wouldn't. I'm heading back to see artisan wool producers Emma and Susie, who together are building a business producing high-quality British yarn. But from sheep to wool, every part of the process is fraught with risk. It's shearing day today at Little Grey Sheep, and I am imagining that both Susie and Emma are a little bit nervous this morning because this is the day that they'll find out whether the fleece that they've been waiting for for almost a year is going to be good enough to replenish the stocks of their unique wool. Today is one of their most crucial days. Morning! Checking if they have more lambs on the way and shearing the all-important fleece for that precious wool. Hi! How are you? <laughs> I've just let myself in. Sorry, how are you this morning? Yeah. Lovely to see you. Hello, ma'am. Susie shears 15 sheep an hour, and this year she'll be shearing over 450. Now, this is not your average shearing. This is specialised stuff. So I'm hoping to help out in another way. Good morning, Susie. Good morning. <laughs> do you do any of this shearing? Um, no. It looks so easy. Yeah. And then you try it and you think, oh, It's like Strictly Come Dancing, <laughs> isn't it? Because it's all in the footwork. Yes. Susie's an absolute master at shearing very cleanly. She's very careful. 
That's a beautifully clean sheer. Mine never look like that. <laughs> Mine all have tufts. And <laughs> do you want me to bring one out? I'm not going to offer to shear, right. but I can try and do something kind of helpful. There we go. Right. Do you want a stein? Yeah, you bring right. it backwards out of this door here. There we go. Perfect. Thank you very much. I love watching this. It's so beautiful to watch. And you make it look so easy, but I can absolutely tell you, having tried to do this, there is nothing easy about it. And much as I would love to have a go, because this fleece is so precious and every single centimetre of it counts, I wouldn't dare. Normally, sheep are shorn later in the year. However, Susie shears her ewes in the winter when the fleece is at its best. They're then kept in a warm barn until after lambing. Beautifully done. When you see the fleece come off here, do you think, yeah, I've done a good job? Yeah, as I'm shearing it, I can see how nice it is as it's falling open yeah. away from the fleece. Yeah. It's really pleasing to see how lovely it is. It is gorgeous. We'll let you carry on, because I want to then have a proper look at this. Over the next three weeks, they will sort through one and a half tonnes of fleece. It's only now when Emma hand inspects every one, sorting for colour and length, that she can see if it's good enough to be spun into their exclusive yarn. Her daughter Belle is helping out. So looking at this fleece, the first one of the morning, Yes. are you feeling cheerful? I'm feeling happy. Good, good. <laughs> OK, that's a very good thing. It's only at this point, really, that we get a real feel for how good the fleeces are. Right. You can see here, this is what's happened with the rain that we've had. It's gone sort of crispy. Can you feel that, Kate? Yes, it actually goes yeah. like my hair does. <laughs> it's sort of dreadlocked. <laughs> so we would just put that to one side. OK. There's no point sending anything that's not right. And this is sometimes where you just cry because you have a beautiful fleece and it's like, oh! Well, two immediate things that I noticed. First of all, the variety of colour. Yes. From really dark to almost white. Right. But the other thing I noticed, how little mess there is yes. in the fleece. It makes an easier job of sorting. Yeah. Because if there is a lot of vegetable matter in the fleece, it does come back in the yarn. Oh, so really? Oh, that, <laughs> that would be a really scratchy well. jumper. <laughs> <laughs> It's then sent off to be washed and spun, a 12-month process. So they won't see any sales or profit from this wool for another year. Susie's expertise is key to their success. She's spent years crossbreeding her flock in search of the perfect wool blend. There's a palpable feeling of relief in the shed because it seems like Susie's careful management of the sheep has resulted in some really lovely fleeces. And I think Emma's quietly very pleased with what she's seeing. But what's extraordinary, there are two things really that strike me here. The amount of care and attention that goes into the fleeces once they've been shorn. But also the lovely thing for me is to see a fleece being valued for what it is, a true and wonderful commodity, and that really is a rarity. Come on, Nan. It's not only peak shearing time. If they're to produce more wool, Susie needs to produce more lambs of the same quality. We bought a new ram this year, oh. and we took a bit of a pump because he had a really low sperm count, so uh -huh. this will be my first chance to know if he's got the girls in the ram. So if he hasn't got them pregnant, then obviously it's going to be a whole year, and we'll be down on our lambing numbers this right. year as well. And down so. then on your fleece production as well. For the following year, yes. OK, so it's so really it's important. Really important. <laughs> 90 days ago, Susie put her ram in with the ewes. 
To keep flock levels up, she's hoping that all of them will be pregnant. Stay there. Good boy, Joe. Right, right, ladies. I'll just grab my scanner. So when are they due? So they're due the early part of April. Right. If I can give you that, yep. I'm going to capture you. OK. And then I'll get you to scan it. So if I put some gel on your... Yep. OK. Should run it by. Yeah, so she's empty. Yeah. So we'll try another one. OK. Here you go. A bit more onto the stomach. That's not that easy with these woolly ones, is no, it? it's not. <laughs> So what we're looking at, the black is the fluid. Then she's got another one down here. So twins. And is that usual for this breed? breed? Yeah. So there's a really good shot of the lamb there. Only to your eyes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, well, that's so great that's news. that's really good news. That's really good news. Here you go. OK. So she's in lamb as well. Yeah, there we are, yeah. yeah. So she's twins as well. Yeah! Brilliant. So low sperm count, obviously. You've done the job. Yeah. Well done, girls. Well, now you need to look after yourselves now. So Brilliant good. news. I'm delighted for you. Thank you well so much. Well done. <laughs> well done, girls. It's time to deliver the all important results to Emma. We have news. Oh, how'd it go? Well, so the very first one we scanned, empty. Oh, no. And then. Twins. Twins. Oh, fantastic. Twins. Yes. Oh, that's right, yes. brilliant news. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. How have you been going along? Yeah, not too bad. We've got yeah. quite a bit done. When will this all get sent off? We hope to get our fleece away to be washed early February. Gosh, so that is quite soon. So yes. sort of last year's shearing, yes. effectively, is coming back imminently, yes. is it? In the next couple of weeks. Wow. So it's not really until we open the box <gasps> that we can actually look at it and go, have we actually, you know, picked the right fleeces to make a really nice base? Can I come back for that nervous moment? If I promise to make the tea? Yes. <laughs> Try and get some sleep before then. It doesn't sound like you're going to get an awful lot. <laughs> There's something incredibly appealing about the very basis of Emma and Susie's business. But the reality of it, and that's the thing that I've really uncovered today, is that they pile on layer after layer of risk. Because at every stage, something can go wrong. A ram cannot perform, so they can't have enough lambs. The fleeces can get ruined by the weather. They don't have enough fleece. And even when the yarn comes back, there's no guarantee that that's going to be exactly right. So although I totally salute them for running a business in this way, my goodness, it's not for the faint-hearted. I'll be back in four weeks' time to find out if last year's wool has been turned into yarn that meets their exacting standards. The forests of Hampshire are home to many different species, from the magnificent English oak to the more exotic Japanese cedar. And one local craftsman is carving a business from this amazing natural resource right on his doorstep. For me, wood just seems the most practical, the most versatile and enjoyable material to work with. We've used it for thousands of years, and for me, it just feels so natural to use it. I can't really think of anything else that I'd rather work with. My name's Oliver Spendley. I'm a furniture maker, and my workshop's based in the New Forest. I specialise in live edge dining tables and kitchen island blocks, which is my take on a traditional kitchen island cross butcher's block. I've enjoyed working with wood for as long as I can remember. I've naturally just been creative and that was something that I knew that I was definitely going to do was create for a living, I suppose. After school, I spent five years doing a woodworking apprenticeship, specialising in boat building. And from there, I was engaged in all sorts of other woodwork, spent time with fine furniture makers and timber framers, log cabin building, and all sorts of other disciplines. And this is something that I really enjoyed, so I, I thought I'd pursue this. I 
I think what's special about what I do is that I only use windfall trees that come down in a storm. That's something that I am extremely passionate about. The main hurdle really was to accessing the timber, and it still is. There's not an abundance of trees that naturally fall down. But as that's so important to me, that's something that I'll always keep as the premise of my work, really. The ethos of what I do is to use our native hardwoods in a way to really show off the natural features and shape of that original tree. The original contours and lines and cracks and splits and to use it in its natural form is the best way for me to really showcase it, I think, do it justice. When a tree comes down, most of them are then milled on the site, so slabbed up into planks, and then they are transported to a place to dry out. And for every inch of thickness within the board, it's a minimum of a year so that has to air dry before it would then be able to be used. At the point where the timber is dry enough to be worked on, as it comes into the workshop, I'll put it through the planer which surfaces the timber. From there, the tops have to be sanded through different grades. At this stage, I can now measure out how wide the table is going to be. I'm going to use these pieces as capping ends. They'll form part of the structure of the table, which makes two pieces of interesting timber a practical, usable uh, surface. If I'm making a tabletop from a few pieces of wood, I can use a combination of joinery techniques and modern fastenings to create a tabletop. It's a combination of traditional tools and techniques and modern tools. I think that they both have their place. This is a classic example of it by using the router to take out most of the material and then using a traditional chisel from the 70s. I think that that's something that my customers really appreciate and you can tell uh, within the work itself. It's time and effort have been put into a piece of furniture like this. So I think this is as far as I can take it today. Um, the next step is going to be to inlay a piece of glass down through the middle here to create a really nice flat surface and it will just bind the whole piece together. So I'll make a template of that and that will get sent off uh, to the glass guy. And as well, through these natural cracks, I'll inlay these bow tie joints and that gives strength to the crack. So down here and up here. And I'll probably fill these with black resin as well to finish that off. So I think that will be a job for, for another time. I think for me it's not to overthink a piece. The contrast between the straight lines and the natural edge is what really works well in my opinion. I don't really have set prices just because each piece is so different and bespoke. So nothing standard from the sizes of the tables to the price. If the table I'm making is particularly big, it can take from a week to a couple of weeks to complete one piece of furniture. So there is a lot of time that goes into them, but I think that that shows in the finished product. The majority of the people that are interested in my furniture love to know that they've got a table from a tree that's been grown locally. I think that in the right environment, the furniture that I make could last for as long as the tree had grown for or, or surpass it. So that's quite an interesting thought. It's been four weeks since I last met Emma and Susie, whose bespoke business is breathing new life into the British wool industry. Susie and Emma have bred their own type of sheep, unique to this farm and specifically for the wool that they produce. Now, earlier this week, they had a delivery of yarn made from last year's wool, and this is a pretty crucial moment for them, because if that yarn is good, then their business can continue and flourish. But if, for some reason, it hasn't worked, then this whole enterprise is going to have been for nothing.
Good morning. There you are. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Really good, thank you. Lovely to see you. Oh, well, now, uh, the good thing is, you're both looking quite cheerful. <laughs> Last year's fleece was sent off to be washed and spun. This is the first time they'll see the finished product. Come on, Emma! <laughs> <Hands are cold. laughs> if this batch is not up to scratch, they'll have lost £4,000 and all hope of profit for this year. Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> is this always quite a nerve-wracking moment? It is, really. Am I allowed to have a little, yes, of little feel? Yes, a squidge. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, it just, it feels so soft. This You're... is great because the colour is just... That's exactly what you yes. wanted. OK. Yeah. If the wool hasn't been right for whatever reason, you can't sort of send it back and start again. I mean, you've got... No, that's, that's it, it isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That Nothing. is actually terrifying. Yes. I am getting better, and you'll be <laughs> pleased to know. <laughs> <laughs> but it must be really interesting for you as well, Susie, to absolutely understand what your management has done to yeah. produce that yarn. Yeah, it's really important that I see the final product because otherwise I'm doing it blind, if you like. Yes. And then also for the breeding of the sheep as well. What happens to it now? I need to wind this off into hanks. Yeah. And then we need to soak it. Right. So that's a job for the next couple of days. Yes. I have got some already soaking of our stein that I've been working oh, on. Oh, have you? So I can see a bit of the dyeing. Well, I've set it up for you to help me, actually. Okay. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> I should learn by now, shouldn't I? There's no just looking. Yeah. All so, right. So um, we can go and do that if you want. Uh, I'd love to. Right. All right. Susie, we'll okay. see you in a bit okay. later. Okay. Right. okay. Thanks. <laughs> To add the finishing touch to this unique product, Emma has crafted a bespoke colour palette that she uses to hand dye all the yarn herself. Just really, the way I dye is a lot of my variegated yarns are just painted. So it's a little bit like, really? just I mean, go for it. So dip into a colour. Yeah. And then we're going to start painting Literally, like that? Yeah. Just anywhere? Anywhere. Oh, look at that colour. That's lovely. And you mix it up like that? It's slightly different if it's um, a solid colour because obviously you need to do the solid colours for people to be able to do a jersey, for example. Do you do this with every single bit of yarn that you produce? Um, right from the beginning we started doing this and I think that's where we've got the reputation for our colour. Yeah. Because people really love our colour palette. It's incredibly labour intensive. Oh, uh, it's phenomenally labour intensive, but you know, it's putting the care into the final product that's gone in all the way along the line. If you're doing it like this, every skein is going to be different. Yes, you can use the same colours, but each time it's a different effect, but that's part of the beauty of it. You get these little pops of colour as you knit, and obviously it's very individual and unique. Yeah. Do you think it's possible to be successful and viable and still quite small and artisan? I do, because I think, um, you know, we all get uh, carried away with turnover. Yeah. But actually, it's about profit and profitability. Yeah. Um, and um, I suppose it may be a bit cliché, but it's about quality of life. Yeah, you, know, know, well, you wouldn't not... go into doing no. something like this if so it wasn't So it's for about that. sustaining the farm, making sense of the farm. Yeah. So it's not just about how big this business can get. I think I completely yeah. get that. You can have enormous turnover and still no profit, and you can lose sight of the passion that started a business in the first place. Yeah. So now this, I... I'm sort of amazed, from particularly my inexpert daubing, oh. <laughs> how actually beautiful it looks. There we go. <laughs> Look at that. We need to cook this now. Really? Yes. <laughs> then um, we can let it dry and then it'll be rewound and it'll be humble socks. <laughs> <laughs> While Emma is focusing on finishing and getting the wool to market, Susie is preparing for lambing so she can increase the flock and the amount of fleece for future wool production. So Susie with the sheep then, do you think? Yeah, yeah. Does she ever get involved in the dyeing and things like that as well? She used to do a lot of dyeing um, yeah. with me, but now she's so busy with the flock. Yeah. Um, 
obviously the flock has increased in size quite dramatically. Yeah. So she's pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty yeah. flat out as she is. With 450 sheep to tend to and more lambs on the way, it's no mean feat. Hello. Hello, Hi. girls. Oh, it's lovely and warm in here. Look at them all, shorn and neat. Well, I have to say that I have... I've loved hearing your story. I love the genesis of this business, you know, shepherd and knitter getting together. I mean, it's been going for, what, sort of nine years mm. now, hasn't it? Did you imagine that you'd be in this place when you started nine years ago? No, no. I don't think so. I don't <laughs> think we gave too much thought to where we were going when we started initially, really? yeah. But you have said that neither of you have taken a salary, neither of you have actually taken any money out of the business at all. And, you know, to sound a little hard-hearted, that's not really a business, is it? That's a hobby. Mm. We've put a lot of investment back in through machinery. Mm. You know, we've brought chalk grassland back to wildflower meadows, we've planted hedgerows. But, yes, I think now we're at a sort of a stage where we can actually, I wouldn't say take a traditional salary, so, <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> but be able to pay ourselves um, some money from the business. When you took on this farm, it hadn't been farmed mm. for a very long time. And I'm guessing that one of the things you should both be very proud of is being able to stand out there in the fields and look at healthy grassland yeah. um, with livestock living on it. Probably my most proud achievement was because I've been trying to breed uh, my, through my sort of breeding programme, improve the, the fibre that we have for the yarn. Yeah. We've recently had some tested yeah. and it's come back sort of akin to fine merinos. So wow. we are, or I am going in the right direction with it. Yeah. Being able to produce such fine quality yarn was always our basis. We never believed that you should buy British because it's British. You want to buy British because it's fabulous. Yeah, I know you're lambing in a couple of weeks, yeah. um, so I'll be thinking of you. Thank I you. I hope that these lambs produce you beautiful yarn. And um, if you need any help, call me. I've always <laughs> loved doing the night shift. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't know why no I'm problem. offering that. <laughs> Take care, both well, of you. Thank you. It was an absolute pleasure. Lovely, lovely. lovely Thanks very much. What's become obvious during my time with Emma and Susie is that no one with hard-nosed commercial ambitions would ever have set up a business like theirs. Theirs is an enterprise based on curiosity, on let's have a go and see, and on passion. And it's those things that have come together to create a business with a story, with a loyal customer base, and most importantly, with a future. So Emma and Susie have every right to be really proud of what they've achieved. Next time, I'll be in the three counties of Herefordshire, Worcestershire and Gloucestershire, following more brave businesses battling to harness nature. Five months of work could all be wasted. Potentially, yes to carve a living off the land. Yeah.